us bow our heads in preparation for the teaching of God's Word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings today. We uh, thank you for the rain. We know the passage where it says the rain falls on the just and unjust alike, and this is part of your logistical grace for all mankind. We just pray that you might give the believers here traveling mercies as they travel back home. And Father, help us to continue to pursue a relationship with you, Father, taking in your word on a day-by-day -day basis and appropriating and applying these things through the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. We pray this afternoon that you might open our eyes, that we might behold wonderful things out of your word. Sanctify us through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this afternoon we're going to go over the parable of the soils. Some say it's a parable of the sower, but it's really more about the soil. Uh, and uh, this parable is mentioned in three gospel records. It's mentioned in Mark or Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9, and explained in Matthew 13, 18 to 23. This is given also in Mark 4, 3 through 8, and explained in Mark 4, excuse me, Mark 4, 14 to 20. And then finally, it's given the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. It's given and explained in this section. Now, in this parable, we have four types of soil. We have the seed that fell by the wayside. We had seed that fell on rocky ground. We have seed that fell on thorny ground. And then we finally have seed that fell on good ground. And let's begin reading here in Luke chapter 8, verse 5. Luke 8, verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Notice that. It's interesting that Luke adds uh, information that the other Gospels don't add. Luke mentions that this seed was trampled down. I find this interesting. Uh, and that the birds of the air devoured it. Now later on, we're going to look at the explanation of this. And we know that the seed is the Word of God. And the birds, of the, and then Satan is the one who's opposing the word of God. But this, tramp, this word is trampled down. It's trampled down. Now, what would that mean? What would something trampled down mean? Well, the Greek word trampled down means to treat with the utmost contempt. To treat with the utmost contempt. So we normally think of Satan snatching a seed out of the word, out of the heart before it can be germinated. And really we blame it all on Satan because a person don't believe the gospel. But I find this interesting though, this is the rejection from the individual. It was repudiated, it was trampled. And uh, therefore, let's take a look at this word in Matthew 7, verse 6. Matthew 7, 6. This same Greek word, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Okay. So there will be various responses to the kingdom message. Now keep in mind, the kingdom message was when the disciples were offering the kingdom. We had that short period of time when they were going around preaching the kingdom. And I believe that message will be Reoffered again in the tribulation period after the rapture of the church. So, but I think we can. It can also there can also be application to the teaching of the word today. And certainly, these things still apply today, as far as their effect and how Satan steals the word and you know people repudiate it and uh, many times the thorns choke out the effectiveness of the word. So I think by application here, as we look at this. Uh, there's certainly principles to be applied to the church, but we have to keep in mind primarily, and this is where Matthew, Matthew focuses on the term kingdom, 
And he mentions that it's the word of the kingdom that's for being proclaimed. And so the initial context is dealing with the offer of the kingdom by the disciples. But again, the, there can be application to the church. Now, in uh, the word of the kingdom, then, and so really we're dealing with the idea that um, the word of the kingdom was being sown. One question that would arise naturally is, why was Jesus' ministry not more fruitful? So the immediate context deals with that. Why was Jesus' ministry not more fruitful? The answer would be that pro productivity is determined by receptivity. And receptivity is a matter of the heart. It's the same seed going out, but different responses. And sometimes when we proclaim the truth of God's word or witnessing or talking to someone, we think, why well, the reason why people don't respond is because we could have said it differently, or maybe they're upset, or maybe this is going on and that's going on. And it's the same message. And really what the problem is, the negativity of the hearer. And uh, so we should not blame ourselves uh, when people do not automatically respond to the truth. Uh, there's other questions we need to ask. What about Satan trying to distract the individual from believing? And we'll look at a couple verses on that as well. So there's a spiritual element going on in the background when we're giving truth. And many times we miss that spiritual dynamic when the word goes out. So there's a human dynamic and then there's a spiritual dynamic. And therefore, both are at play when the Word of God goes forth. So the differences then are not found in the Word, it's the same seed, but in the preparation of the soil to receive the Word. The four soils represent four types of reception people give about preaching the kingdom. And again, that message was offered when Jesus was here uh, to the nation of Israel and will be offered again in the tribulation period. So the word of God in verse in Luke 8, 5 was trampled down, meaning the individuals treated it with contempt. And then it says the birds of the air devoured it. And later on when he explains the meaning of that, we see that Satan snatches the word of God out of their heart. And uh, notice here in verse 12 in Luke 8, he said those by the wayside are the ones who hear then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. And we're going to look at a couple of verses on how there's satanic activity around the teaching of the truth, especially the teaching of the right gospel. For the proclaiming of the gospel, Satan wants to oppose that truth. And therefore, he distracts individuals from believing. Next, he says, let's take a look uh, back in Luke 8 to Luke 8, 6. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away. Now here, Luke adds, because it lacked moisture. Uh, whereas the other gospels said it didn't, you know, it was shallow, it didn't have any root. Okay, there's two issues here. The roots weren't deep enough, and lacking moisture. So it's interesting. Combined gospel accounts, we have two things going on with the second soil. Now, third soil fell among thorns, verse 7, and the thorns sprang up and choked it. Choked it. Now, thorns and, and the seed grow together, but one takes over the other. The thorns start to take over the, uh, the seed. And then finally, verse 8, but others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. Now, the other gospel writers mentioned there is a varying degrees. They add this new contradiction here, but the other gospel writers mentioned there's other degrees of, uh, of uh, production. So here, though, Luke says a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. They were believers here. But to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, 
and hearing they may not understand. So these parables intentionally reveal some truths to everyone who heard them, but only Jesus' disciples could understand the deeper significance of what they taught. And I would say this, only believers can really comprehend the teaching of the Word of God. The unsaved, the natural man, the Bible says, does not uh, appreciate, welcome the teaching of the things of God's Word. So one of the principles of spiritual growth is that when a person responds positively to revelation, God gives him or her the ability to understand more truth. So when we're positive to the truth that we do know, God can teach us more. But if we start to reject the truth that we are presented with, then there's no more need for further growth at that point, even as a Christian. So that's why it's very important that when we hear the Word of God taught accurately, we have to uh, humble ourselves, accept what God has to say above our opinion, and therefore once we do that we start to grow and God can give us new truth. He doesn't give us all truth at once. You know, we don't have like a jump drive we can plug into our brain and all of a sudden boom. You know, God created us to learn bit by bit. That's the way it is, you know. And so it takes time. And that takes what? What does that take ultimately? Perseverance, doesn't it? We are an instant society. We want everything right now. Right, give, me, give me this right now, right this moment. And we get upset, and I'm included in that, when we don't get it right away, right? <laughs> you can think of this our illustration this week. Yeah, we ordered pizza, and they screwed our order up. So I tried to get a hold of the... I tried to get a hold of the call center. That was shut down. They called it, and the person said, well, I said, can't you call the store? Well, no, no, we can't do that. We can't. It's like, well, why can't I call the store directly? Because it's the call center. I said, if it's a call center, why can't? It's like we went around and around. <sighs> so eventually I drove to the store and talked to the manager in person. Yes. That's a long story anyway. Did you get the right pizza? I was just going to ask. Okay. <laughs> well, the second time I got it, but it was a, it was a mess. It was just like, oh. <laughs> anyway. But he did give me a two liter of cherry, uh, Pepsi, uh, <laughs> warm things over. But you know. <laughs> We are so impatient, aren't we? We want it now, want it now, want it right now. Yeah. I think sometimes that's the way with the Word of God. We want a seminar that all of a sudden will solve all our problems. So if we go to this little seminar, this weekend little session, everything will be answered, right? This will be the solution. And that's not the way it works. It's little by little. And Isaiah said, here little, there little. Line upon line, line upon line. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. And then we accumulate it, we accumulate it. And if we're positive, we receive more. And it takes time, growth takes time. You don't grow that way all of a sudden, boom. You know, you're an adult. It takes time, and so is the, with the Word of God as well. But we need to be positive though. It's a matter of how receptive we are to the Word of God. I think that's one of the keys here in this lesson. God gives us the ability to learn more truth. However, when one does not respond positively, God hides further truth from him and her. Uh, Luke 8.18, for example. Luke 8.18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. How you hear. You mean it doesn't matter how I hear? Yes. We hear with what? Humility. We hear with accepting God's view over our view. We don't get angry or respond negatively to if it's taught right, the Word of God. It's very important that we concentrate when we hear the Word of God. Take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. Now, think about in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, we have believers who are saved for decades, but they became dull of hearing. That word dull means lazy. Lazy. They became lazy of listening. They become tired, so their mind's kind of on something else. Sunday morning serving, they're thinking about, you know, a meal afterwards or family matters and they're kind of halfway listening. I'm here, God, aren't you pleased? I'm here, yeah. I'm in church, I'm filling space here. 
Uh, but they're really not focusing on what God has for them to say. And you become lazy. And then you start forgetting what you've already accumulated. Negativity sets in. And you start challenging the message. And uh, then you're down the destructive spiral of turning eventually away from truth. And it's a very dangerous cycle. But drifting is slow. You don't notice if you've ever been out to sea just how far you slowly drift, 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 and all of a sudden you can't see the horizon anymore. And that's what believers do when they are negative to the Word of God, to the teaching of God's Word. Uh, look at Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. This is a allusion from this passage here. He said, Go and tell this people. So God's exhorting Isaiah, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. How about that? <laughs> You need to tell the people, but you know what? They're, they're going to hear, but they're not going to perceive. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. That's exactly what we had in the book of Hebrews, by the way. Make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Then he said, how long, Lord, how long? Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. Hmm. The teaching of the word was actually a judgment upon a nation that rejected the truth. You ever think about that? Light is here, but you're sinning against the light. And therefore, it's actually a form of judgment. And it's a form of judgment for the someone who's negative to the teaching of God's word. And actually, the word of God is there to judge that individual. And that's a pretty sobering thought. Now let's go back to our passage in Luke, verse 11 here. Uh, now the parable is this. See, now he begins to explain it. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. And what one writer summarized, I like his summary of these four soils. This would be the uninterested hearers. The uninterested hearers. They're not really interested in hearing. Uh, the second group, the one that fell on the rocks, we'll go back to this passage here, but I just wanted to summarize these four. The impulsive hearers. You know, they receive the word with joy, but they're you know, impulsive. They do things by impulse. They're just like a flash in a pan, you know, or a Meteor flashes across the sky. They're really bright for a while. They fizzle out. And uh, then we have the third type of hearer, the one that fell among the thorns, the, the distracted hearers. They're distracted. The distracted hearers. And then the final, the final one that fell on the good ground, these are ready and faithful hearers. They're ready. They're prepared. And they're faithful in their hearing. They're consistent. Readiness and consistency. Those are two great virtues of learning doctrine. So those are, that's kind of a, just a summary of where we're going here. Now, the first one here, the one that fell by the wayside that we saw that earlier they were trampled underfoot, meaning there's volitional responsibility. The individuals were, were not interested in receiving the truth. So it's not like they were passively, Satan snatches the word out of their heart. And, oh, I really want to believe that, but you know, that's not the case. It's like they repeat it. It's like the example given, I think, be like Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then went God hardened his heart. So we had the both divine and human element going on in the communication of the word of God, especially in giving the gospel. They hardened their heart against the truth, and therefore God hardened their heart. In this case, Satan snatched the seed before it germinated. Now, this is simple. I'm not an uh, agricultural or horticultural expert here. But for a seed to have life, what does it take? For a seed to have life, what does it take? Dirt, water, okay. water, Dirt, water. Yeah. <laughs> sun. All right. But what I'm saying is, when do you recognize life in a seed? When it sprouts through the soil, when it germinates. That's the answer I was given. Germinate. Germination, right? 
Whether that seed bears fruit or not, the seed is alive. And I think this is the point that people miss about this illustration. Because if we want to say that, okay, it's clear that the first per person, Luke indicates that the person is, uh, the, the state, Satan snatches the word, verse 12, out of heart, lest they should believe and be saved. That's clear they're unbelievers, right? Uh, the seed does not germinate, right? It just, you've seen birds grab seeds that are on the ground, boom. Doesn't sprout, doesn't germinate, no life, right? Okay. Next, though, we see seed that uh, fell on the rocks, but they receive the word of God with joy. They have no root. And for believe for a while, and time and temptation fall away. But this is seed that germinates. There's life. And I believe here in the second, in the second soil, these are believers. These are born again believers. And the third soil, these are born again believers. And I show you why I believe they're believers here. And then finally, in the last soil, we have mature believers. We have believers that go on to bear fruit. So, and it's interesting, and uh, some most teaching that you hear, people will say, well, these in only believe for a while, therefore that was kind of a head faith instead of a heart faith, and that kind of nonsense. And when the Bible doesn't qualify faith, they, you know, the prior verse that they did not believe here, it says they believe. You take a straightforward reading, you know, this is genuine faith. And they say, well, it didn't persevere, therefore it wasn't genuine faith. Now, wait a second. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of those scriptures on that. But I want to finish here, that first soil. Now, so those by the wayside, the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. See, the only requirement for salvation here, and even the gospel of the kingdom, is a matter of faith. Faith alone, in Christ alone. Even John says, Behold the Lamb of God, when he's offering the kingdom. He was announcing the king was coming, the king was coming, but the second half of that kingdom message was, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Faith in the Messiah. So faith in the, alone in the Messiah. And um, Satan distracts, I think, gospel preaching. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Satan is here called the God of this age. And it says, Whose mind the gods of this God of this age has blinded, who, what? Do not believe. Do not believe. I'm going to fight whole See? I'll call you back. Now, it shows you here that what happens first. Their mind has been blinded before they can believe. See that? Their mind is blinded to the truth before they believe. Okay? Lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, should, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Now, how does this work? I th I've seen this at, in operation many times. I remember I used to go with my pastor. We'd go and do a home visitation, and we'd go through the community and you know door to door evangelism, and uh, went in one home, and he was giving the gospel. Started to get the gospel. I had this lady's attention. She was listening. Started to get the gospel. Phone rang or something. This another someone came in the room, you know. And so her mind's not on the gospel now, her mind's on something else. Or at church, I've seen this happen, you know, something, maybe a bird hits the window or something like that, or whatever, some noise outside, you know. People's minds are taken off of what's important. And Satan does that, he likes to distract the mind, see. And that's why we need to pay attention to the gospel, but Satan doesn't want that person's attention. I think that's part of the attack. Before they can understand the word of God and exercise faith, Satan points them in a different direction. And I think that's part of the, what the seed being snatched means before it can germinate. He distracts gospel preaching. There's several things that Satan do. Number, secondly, Satan promotes the false gospel. Obviously, you know, with the true gospel, he would want that person be distracted. Uh-oh, it's a dangerous situation. We have someone who actually knows what the gospel is, presenting it 
We don't want that to happen. We don't want that person to believe. So let's have this thing happen over here, you know. And uh, then secondly, though, Satan promotes the false gospel. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. For no, and no wonder Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Satan was a light bearer, remember, original Lucifer. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, means his spokesmen, those who are teaching the truth, or are teaching the word, not the truth, no, no great thing of his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Now what kind of righteousness? We went over this last week. This is self-righteousness. Human goodness for salvation. They preach a works gospel. So Satan has proponent, proponents of the works gospel. Human goodness out there. So he distorts the gospel. And the accurate gospel, he distracts. And then, even for believers, I find it interesting that, look at Second Corinthians, the same chapter, 2 Corinthians 11, just go up a few verses, verses 3 and 4. He's talking to believers here. Satan also operates against the word of God. For I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted. Notice the battles where? In the mind. Your minds may be corrupted from the single-minded devotion. The simplicity means your devotion that is in Christ Jesus, meaning you're distracted. The single-minded devotion means looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, right? You're distracted as a Christian from growing in the Lord. And even if one comes and preaches another Jesus, said you're, you're ready to put up with this individual. He's not preaching the Jesus of the Bible. He's preaching the moral Jesus, uh, you know, the social justice Jesus is being preached today. He's not preaching the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, and so Satan can also distract believers from growth in that sense. So he's always attacking God's truth. Keep in mind, Satan is always the uh, opponent, the adversary, the enemy, attacking God's word. Now, Back in our text in Luke, so lest they should believe and be saved, lest they should believe and be saved, believe we have eris active participle, eris tense. And the idea of eris is past action. This is not continual belief. This is a one-time action. Why? This is a very important. The eris tense in this, per this verse is very important. It shows you it only takes a moment to believe. You don't have to continually believe in order to be saved. And so we begin, when we get to the next soil, when they believe for a while, present tense, they're still saved. The error said, lest they should do what? Believe. It didn't say present tense. You know, he steals a word, lest they continually believe to prove they're saved. No, error tense. Believe in a moment. And all it takes is one moment of faith in order to have eternal life. Now, once you exercise faith after you're born again, that's walking by faith. That's living by faith. And I could have faith other than faith in the gospel. I could have faith that God will take care of my needs. God will fulfill this promise in the word of God. You know, whatever it is. There's many different areas where we apply faith. See? Um, but that's not the same as that one moment directed toward the cross of Christ and believing in Christ for eternal life. That only takes one time. And by the way, when you're born, when you're born physically, no matter what happens afterwards, you're you're a person. <laughs> you are a person that God made in God's image. Uh, so same with the new birth. We enter into the new birth in a moment in time. And once we have that, we have it forever. So the lest they should believe and be saved. Now, let's take a look at um, uh, the next one. The ones on the rocks. The ones that fall on the rocks are those when they hear, receive the word with joy. Now, some people say, well, these are, this is driven by emotion. I've heard this taught. Oh, these are simply emotional Christians, and they're, they're, they're swept up in the emotional moment, like at a revival service. 
you know how the advantage try to work work the crowd, so to speak. Oh, work the crowd. I'm gonna, you know, raise my voice, I'm gonna march up and down, you know, it's like a cheerleading session. You know, I've got these people worked up here. And then people make an emotional commitment, you know. And really it's not a commitment that saves you, it's faith in Christ. But I don't think though that's true because this is genuine faith. This is used in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word. See? They received his word, right? They believed the gospel. They were baptized. And that day was added about 3,000 souls. And what did they do, by the way, in verse 44? Now all who believed were together and had all things common. They believed. See? Now, they gladly received his word. That's receiving the word with joy, right? It's genuine faith. It's not a phony faith here. This is genuine faith. Acts 17.11. Acts 17.11. These were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica that they received the word with all readiness. Same word for receive. They received. They received the word with readiness. Search the scriptures daily to find whether these things were so. These were the noble, noble Bereans. So the idea of receiving the word with joy is not a phony faith. It's genuine faith. But the problem is that there's no root. There's no root. Now, how can we have roots as a believer? Well, we need to be rooted and grounded in the truth. Ephesians 3.17 is written for believers. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, you read that and say, doesn't he dwell in all believers? Yes. But we have a particular Greek word here, not just simple residing or, in, or dwelling in. We had the word to dwell down. It's a more intense Greek word. It means to be at home. I could be here in a room, but I, this is not my home. Okay? So it's one thing to be in a room, and it's another thing to, this is your home. You're comfortable in your own home, right? So that Christ may dwell in your heart. Every aspect of our life, Christ has control over. The word literally means dwell down. He might dwell down in your hearts through faith as you walk by faith as a believer. Then that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend the love of Christ, the length, width, breadth, the depth, and height of Christ, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. This is a deeper experience for the believer that we might be rooted and grounded in the word of God, be firmly planted. Remember the... the the uh, Psalm chapter 1 about the tree by the living waters that's grounded, you know. It takes time for roots to develop. And so as we continue in the word of God, we can be grounded in the truth. So these people, yeah, they respond by faith to the gospel, but they're not, they're not there consistently to grow as a Christian. They're like new babes. But they're new babes, though. They just, you know, lose interest. And I've seen examples of this as a pastor over, you know, over 20 years. People that really excited, started well, but then fade away. Drift away from the church, drift away from the Lord. They're still born again. They're still saved by God's grace, but they don't grow. And what also distracts them? It says here, in time of temptation, they fall away. They don't realize that, yes, we have the joy of knowing we have eternal life. Now, that's tremendous. But do you know what? Your faith will be tested. And uh, that's where the challenge comes in. How will we respond to the Lord when our faith is put to the test? When things are not going as well at work. When people make fun of you as a new believer. Uh, make fun of your faith. What happens when persecution arises? What happens when you lose your job as a Christian? Uh, what happens when you really have to believe in the Lord? Uh, faith must be tested. And this is for a believer because James 1 indicates a process of testing, right? The book of James, I think, is parallel to many of these things. When I taught through the book of James, I drew a parallel between James 
in the parable of the sower because I find a lot of similar things mentioned. My brethren, he's addressing believers, James 1, 2, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Those various, multiple, multiple tests. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience or endurance. And that's the key. If we respond positively to the test, we build up endurance, just like a runner who can run further. You know, if he quits within 100 yards, he can't run 200. If he quits at 200, he can't run 300. So we have to have multiple tests in our life. We pass that one good. I'm going to send you one a little more difficult. All right, pass that, great. And so we're mature now. We're able to handle some of the details of life. We don't fall apart like other people do. Our faith becomes strong. And uh, this builds up what? Endurance. We'll see that word here in Luke. But let endurance have its complete work. I Meaning let the, let, the, let the trial continue for this purpose to mature you. I find it interesting, every time we run into a difficult situation, we first thing we pray, Lord, take it away. Maybe God doesn't want to take it away. Maybe we should pray, your will be done. If you're teaching me something through this, help me to learn the lessons through this trial, not necessarily, take it away, Lord. Even Paul said he requested three times the thorn in the flesh, remove it. And the Lord says, my grace is enough. I don't want to remove that because I have a purpose. You saw the third heaven. <laughs> you become very arrogant and proud saying, look what all the things I know. You know, even Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 about a person who has knowledge without love, you know. He's like a noisy, like the gong show. You ever watch a gong show? Okay. <laughs> Just a noisy gong, right? Clanging, clashing cymbal. <laughs> like the gong show. Um, so... We need, we need to endure testing. Let patience have its perfect work that you might be what? Mature. The word perfect doesn't mean without sin. I think that's a mistake. Some people read the word perfect thing without sin. That will never happen until the Lord takes you home. It's mature and complete. Lacking no Christian virtue. Lacking nothing means lacking no Christian virtue. So God is working his process through the test. And we can really look at the parable of the soil in regard to the two soils in the middle, the adversity test and then the prosperity test. Now, what if God, I, by the way, I've seen more people fall away in God's blessing than in difficulty. Difficulties tend to drive us to the Lord, it should at least. Prosperity makes us forget God. And that's why even the proverb writer says, I don't want to be rich or poor you know, so I won't forget God or, you know, I'll curse God for not having enough, basically. So he's saying here, now the adversity test here is what we're dealing with right now. Difficulties in life, testings and trials. Um, Matthew 13, 21 adds tribulation, by the way. When we look at Matthew 13's account, the Gospel of Matthew adds tribulation and persecution. So Matthew's gospel adds a couple more. Matthew 13, 21. So this individual has no root in himself but endures for a while for when tribulation or persecution arises, notice because of the word, that's very important. Because of the word. So the word that they've taken in they're persecuted because of that. This is a believer, the language here. They're persecuted for their faith because of the word. Uh, now, testing or trials, circumstantial, persecution, people. That's a difference, right? Persecution comes from people. Tribulation comes from circumstances, difficult circumstances. Where tribulation literally means to squeeze the press on every side. You ever feel like you're in a tight box, you know? <laughs> There's nowhere to go but God, right? 
God, I tried to fix this myself. If I go this way, this will happen. I go that way, that will happen. I go that way. You know, it's like, there's nowhere to go. I can't, I'm, there's no, nothing humanly that I can do. Yeah, okay, now you want me to take over? <laughs> but God. So, Matthew adds uh, two more things. Test the tribulation and persecution arises because of the word. And then he says he stumbles, trips up. By the way, use Jesus sold the word to Peter, even his disciples. All of you will be offended because of me this night. You're going to stumble. You're going to stumble. So it's used as something that happens to believers. Now, uh, persecution, we know that even that will not separate us from God's love, right? Romans 8.35. Tribulation, testing, persecution, none of those things. So these two words, by the way, Tribulation and persecution are mentioned in Romans 8.35 as even that not separating us from God's love. God's permitting it to mature us, mature our faith. Um, so those individuals here, the flash in the pan Christians, they are believers, they with joy receive the word, but they don't develop roots. They are continuing the word of God. Even Jesus told his disciples, it's interesting, these are already believers. Jesus said his disciples, told his disciples, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What was that, John 8, 31? Somewhere in that area. So, the, these individuals fall away. Now, by the way, Hebrews 3, 12, that word is used for believers, believers who could fall away. That doesn't mean lose your salvation or it doesn't prove that they weren't born again. But it does show that there's some believers who fail to finish their course like Paul did. Beware, brethren. First of all, he addresses believers. Beware, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Can Christians become unbelievers? Well, do we believe God in every situation? Don't we fail at times? Don't we doubt God? Even Peter getting out of the boat? Didn't he doubt God? He believed for a while, didn't he? What happened? Started to sink. Oh, I'm looking at the storm now instead of Jesus. Doubt, right? Doubt does creep in. And uh, if we continue in that, we'll drift. How do we avoid that, by the way? Look at verse 13. But exhort one another daily. That means motivate or challenge, encourage. encourage. And how do we do that? Hebrews 10, 25. Same word there is. Why do we assemble together live to exhort one another? So that we won't be hard through sin. This, this motivates us through the week to live for God. I love being together with believers. I just love it. It's, it's dynamic. It's encouraging. It's exciting. And that's the way it should be. Lest we be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so we need to continue in the faith as believers. Now let's look at the third ones that fell among the thorns. Verse 14. Now the ones who fell among the thorns are those when they have heard go out and are choked with what? What chokes them? Cares, riches, and pleasures of life. Now, instead of difficulty, we have prosperity. <laughs> we have prosperity, wealth. But along with wealth comes what? Responsibility. You have a lot to take care of. <laughs> and then in general pleasure, pursuit of happiness. We get the word hedonism from that word, pleasure of life, hedonism. And the problem is, it doesn't say they're not saved, but it says they bring no fruit to maturity. See, they, they're not bearing fruit as a Christian, which is God's intention for every believer. And fruit bearing takes time. And we'll see that, by the way, in John 15. We have to continually abide in the vine so that God will produce fruit through us. And remember in John 15, we go from no fruit, John 15 to, what does he do? Deal with, how does he deal with the branch that bears no fruit, lays on the ground? He props up. He lifts up. And then exposes it to the sunlight so that it will bear, what, more fruit. 
No fruit, more fruit, much fruit, fruit that abides. We have four stages in John, John by the way, of fruit bearing. No fruit, more fruit, much fruit, abiding fruit. I mean, the fruit tree is all the way down to the ground. You ever see a pear tree so loaded, or apple tree so loaded, just the fruit goes, and it goes all the way to the ground. That should be our life as a Christian, mature Christian, constantly bearing fruit. These individuals bring no fruit to maturity. They're distracted. They're distracted by prosperity. They're distracted by the things of the world. The world's there to compete with our values. It, it's our time even, by the way. Many times the things of the world, you know, the internet, can be a great time waster. And then it could also, especially the constant here, I think I'm going to bang my head up against while I hear the word coronavirus one more time, but I had to get that illustration. I think I'm just going to drive my head through the sheetrock. You know, just drive me crazy. Sometimes I just turn it off for a day. Boy, I'm happy now. Why am I so happy today? I turned off the news. You know, turned off the internet. Didn't look at anything. I just, oh, just read my Bible. Today. Wow, I feel better, don't I? Well, you know, the things of this world, the cares. That's why Jesus said, cast all your what? Care upon him because it cares for you. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking he whom he may devour. How to resist him? Steadfast in the faith. Faith is the word of God. But it's steadfast. You're consistent. So the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, remember even believers can be deceived by wealth. 1 Timothy 5, 7. 1 Timothy 5, 7 through 10. And Paul's writing here to Timothy. Um, well, I think it's. I think that might be actually chapter six. Yeah, six. First Timothy six. Let's just look at verse nine. But those who desire to be rich will fall into temptation and a snare. See, and the many foolish and harmful desires. I think that's the other pleasures of life would be equal to this in Luke which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, from which some have strayed from the faith. These are believers. They had faith, but they strayed off the path. And their greediness pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See? Pleasures of this life can be a big distraction. They bring no fruit to maturity. Instead of abiding in the vine, they're Pursuing the wealth of the world. Let's deal with the last one here. Verse 15, back in our text. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, knows how they heard. They're in fellowship with God. Very important. They're in fellowship with God. You know, we need to have a bent toward obedience before we hear the word of God. You ever think about that? So it's not like, I'm going to, uh, you know, I think we get the passive idea. I'm going to hear first and decide whether or not I like this. <laughs> decide whether or not I'm going to obey. Uh, you know, it's like a teenager. Well, I want, I got, can you do this? Well, let me hear it first. <laughs> just, just say yes or no, okay? I'm not going to tell you what it is. I want you to be positive first. You may like it. I may surprise you. Do <laughs> you want to go to Dairy Queen? I don't instead of saying you need to clean your room. Just, you know, listen. You know. But uh, I think sometimes we take the passive attitude as I'm going to listen to it first and then kind of mull over and figure out what I want to do. Well, I think we need to be positive in advance of having a noble heart and good heart. A heart bent toward obedience before we hear what God wants us to do. And then they, what? Keep it. 
Next, they keep it. They keep the word of God. They continue in it. They retain it. They probably, you know, repeat it. And they memorize it. They uh, go over it in their mind. They study it. I think all that is keeping the word of God. And uh, then they bear fruit with what? Patience. That's their same word there, by the way, that we saw in James. We have to continue in the word. You know, trials produces what? Endurance. So this is a believer who endures. He's a committed and faithful listener. So, I'll give you the verses. I already gave you the uh, illustration, John, or the uh, fruit bearing. John 15, 2, we have no fruit. We have John 15, 5, the next step. And then fruit that remains is John 15, 16. And then look at John 15, 11. Let's take a look at John 15, 11. He wants us to abide in him, remain in him, that our joy might be, what, full. Not just so we'll have temporal joy, but that we'll have, we'll produce joy. You know, the fruit of the Spirit, what? Joy. You, you ever, I've noticed, if I ever watch, observe a believer over the long haul, now we can all get upset and, you know, we experience loss and things like that. We're not all giddy all the time. But, a Christian who never has any joy or something wrong. Mm -hmm. There's something there that's wrong. There's sin in their life somewhere they haven't dealt with. There's bitterness, maybe. There's something deeper down that needs to be dealt with. And because God came to give us joy and fullness of joy. And when we're obedient to God and doing His will, it's a joyful thing. So, um, this last soil, we need to hear the word of God, and we combine, when, when I study this, combining all four gospel, all three gospel accounts, hearing God's word, receiving God's word, keeping God's word, and understanding God's word. Those four things is in the last soil, see? So we need to continue in the word of God, not just make it uh, once in a while, Go to church on Christmas and uh, Easter, right? See everyone there. <laughs> Christmas and Easter. Where are you the rest of the year? I was bold enough to ask. But, uh, you know, we got to continue to be that last soil. We don't want to be the flash in the pan Christian. We don't want to be the Christian who falls apart when difficult things come. We want to be the believer that continues to abide in his truth. And God can produce fruit through us. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you so much for this parable. And we pray, Lord, as believers, we might not be individuals whose seed fell among a rocky soil. Help us not to have a hard heart against hearing your truth. Or a heart that's distracted with the thorns of the world, the cares of the world but a heart that and soil that's fertile, a soil that's willing to obey, a soil that is willing to listen to what you have for us so that we might be prolific fruit bearers. We might continually abide in the vine, remain in fellowship so that you can use us to help others, Lord, and to benefit others. And we pray that we might continue to go forward, Lord, and that you might sustain us and Lord, uh, we do thank you for your joy. It's a wonderful thing. Help us to continue to abide in it, in your peace and love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.